and Jeremy has been casting his super critical eye over the battlefield. There was a time when the man who bought an off-road vehicle had a piece of straw in his mouth. Today, more often than not, he has a plum. The utilitarian jobs of yesteryear have shaken off their country bumpkin outfits and most these days wear city suits. It's no longer any good offering cars that can only perform off-road. As the top models now have Jaguar-style price tags, they must have Jaguar-style luxury too. Make no mistake, their off-road ability remains undiminished, but their appeal these days is lodged firmly among people for whom the idea of going off-road involves driving into a puddle. Here we have the latest version of the car that virtually killed off Land Rover in Africa. Despite its reputation for ruggedness elsewhere in the world, the only long wheelbase version imported into Britain is the range-topping crumpet truck. This is the Toyota Land Cruiser and the whole thing revolves around big numbers. It's got a 4.2 litre turbocharged six-cylinder diesel engine. It's 16 feet long, six feet high, six feet wide. And the big numbers spill over into the interior as well. I wish someone would explain to the Japanese that we don't measure luxury by how many buttons there are. I've got two for the differential locks, two for the electric aerial, two for the sunshine roof. I must say that when this car rolled up, I was determined to hate it. It's big and brash with its white letter tyres and tacky upholstery. Sort of automotive equivalent of a pair of white socks. Get the impression if you turned up for a day's shooting, the pheasants would die laughing. But I've done a couple of hundred miles in it now, and I'm, I'm getting really rather fond of it. It has an earthy feel about it, which I like. It has a reasonable turn of speed, and it handles with great adroitness for such a leviathan. The steering's a vast improvement over the old model, and so driving it on normal roads is by no means unpleasant. Even so, you're constantly aware that no matter how much it pretends to be a Jaguar, its abilities are more in line with those of a tractor. Well, I wouldn't like to have to do this in a miniskirt. Not that I've got a miniskirt, you understand. Now, the Mercedes is the other way around. The hideous exterior looks might lead you to think that it's a tractor, but the innards, well, they suggest otherwise. I know these pale colours are all very well for people, but I think the sheep might muck it up a bit. As opposed to the Toyota, which in its latest form is only imported as an eight-seater diesel, you can have the G-Wagon as a long or short wheelbase with petrol or diesel power. A word of warning, though, it's impossible to fit a turbocharger to right-hand drive diesel models, and that makes them, well, let's be kind, let's say sluggish. Now, the petrol engines are much better. This is a three-litre six, and as you'd imagine, it's smooth and quiet and refined and blessed with perfectly reasonable levels of performance. As before, there are locking differentials and low-ratio gears, but the new versions now have full-time four-wheel drive and better suspension. It looks the same, though. The biggest change, superficially at least, is in here. All of these trim pieces appear to have been taken from 50 or 60,000 pound Mercedes saloons. And, of course, gives an immense feeling of quality. And, of course, it's all beautifully screwed together. Now, the thing is, is that when you're in any Mercedes, from the smallest 190 up to the biggest coupe, you can't help, metaphorically, looking down on other motorists. When you're in a G-Wagon, you're actually looking down on them. If you want to buy one of these to use primarily as a road car, fine. They both offer a load of advantages over, say, a Jaguar saloon. You sit up high, that gives you a great view of the road, there's tons of space, they're great for towing. And of course the weather can do pretty much what it wants and you'll still be mobile. Disadvantages, well they're not exactly aerodynamic, so the fuel bills are pretty big. And the suspension is designed for off-road use and it makes it a bit bouncy on the road. Now choosing between the Mercedes and the Toyota is more difficult. Although they're designed to do the same job, they both differ in terms of style, so really it's a personal choice. And anyway, they both have a big, big problem. The Range Rover is warming up for its 21st birthday this summer, but even so, in terms of sales, in Britain at least, it knocks the competition into a cocked hat. Not only is it more stylish, you can see the Queen turning up in one, for instance, but it's more elegant in here too, all the wood and leather combines with all the latest toys, the automatic dipping rear view mirror, the electric seats and so on. And of course, this is the only one here to have a V8 engine. And now for 1991 comes another big change. 
Land Rover have fitted anti-roll bars. Wow! No, honestly, it's big news. In the past, if a dog or a chicken or something ran out into the road and you had to take avoiding action, early Range Rovers used to roll around and give the impression they weren't really going to change direction at all. Well, this new model handles much, much better. And Land Rovers say the new roll bars haven't affected its wheel articulation, something that's made the Range Rover so good off-road in the past. As far as I can work out, they haven't harmed ride comfort either. Be in no doubt that the Range Rover is the best off-roader you can buy, even at £34,000 for this Vogue SE. The Land Cruiser is £7,000 less, while a similarly equipped G-Wagon is a staggering £10,000 more. Hardly surprising people don't take them off-road. We did, though. So long ago, the Range Rover led its competition by about, oh, by about that much. But as we've seen, off-road and on it, the gap's getting quite narrow now. It must be down to about, oh, about that, I should say. Now, back here at the motor show, you don't get many 